quirkiness of this instrument, that's what gives it personality. So you don't really want to shy away necessarily from uh, what is inherently a soprano sax and its sound and its personality. But uh, there are certain things that you need to be dealing with all the time to make it as musical as possible. There are, there are, for me, going across the break, we kind of touched on that a little bit, um, yeah. is, is sometimes awkward on all saxophones. But on soprano, like if I just show you my, my soprano, the way it sounds going across the break without adjusting for anything, And it sounds like some kind of European siren or something. You know? <laughs> Ambulance. But, yeah, right? Now, you can hear the pitch. Listen. My E flat is extremely sharp. My C sharp, by comparison, is a little flatter. So um, it's, it's my ear that's going to tell me I need to make an adjustment. And then once I understand from my ear's perspective what's going on, then I make a physical actual change. So in this case, I've got to try to match pitch and timbre going across the break, right? So my, I have to bring the pitch down to the E flat and try to bring the pitch up of the, of the C sharp or D flat so that they're closer together. And also you talked about the timbre of having a whole bunch of fingers down as yeah. opposed to having nothing down. That's just, you've got a saxophone like this, it's got a different kind of tone than, which is darker, right? Right. Now, yeah. now, your pitch is really close. Mine isn't inherently on this horn, so now I've got to bring down yeah. the E-flat to about there. Yeah. But I have to actually get it down that far. And the only way I can do that is by lowering my, my jaw and opening up a little bit. Right. I, you know, talking about lower jaw, I think, I think the thing to do, the play the saxophone, all the saxophones, is to play with emphasis on your lower jaw. Take the, the, take the pressure off your top, the top of part of your face, because, you know, the bottom part of your face is where you chew all your food. So consequently, that's where you have your, all your strength. So you have to play with your, with your jaw out, you know, like this. Mm -hmm. I mean, Joe Allard just showed me a thing. Take the top lip off altogether. <laughs> It forces you to, 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 to play with you, and you get a better sound. You get more edge on your sound mm. if, you, if, you, if you play with, the, with, your, with your jaw more prominent. Mm. It, it puts an edge on your sound, I think. Yeah. yeah. Right, also the, the pitch went up a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah. So then you would, then you would be forced to, to bring the pitch down. And I always think that when you're bringing the pitch down, the sound gets a little bit bigger, as opposed to when you're trying to pitch up. I can't up think to, about things like that. Well, that's <laughs> why I say it's very instinctive for you. You, yeah. you I mean, I, I asked you some questions about how you studied and all, and you said you just kind of figured it out. Joe is a is a kind of player who didn't necessarily take all these technical lessons and how to tongue and how to get a subtone and how to produce a sound. He knew what he liked. He knew the sound that he liked and did what he needed to do technically to get that sound. And it, no one had to tell him what to do. And, and that's basically, as a player, you should be constantly listening to records that you like, the way they sound. We talk about Lucky Thompson, we talk about I mean, Dave Lieben has a completely different soprano sound. If you like those sounds, you're going to make adjustments to sound more like that. And as you develop your own sound and what it is that you like, um, you, it's not like how much mouthpiece to take. Yeah, someone could tell you that. Where to put your tongue on the reed. Yeah, someone could probably tell you that as well. But if you ask Joe, he'd have to kind of think about it. And it's the same with me a little bit. It's like I have yeah. to think about, well, I don't know. Let me see. I think I have about this much horn in my. I got. I put. I think my tongue goes. It's. It's less about knowing those little technical details and more about you really understanding the sound of what you want and then continuing to experiment until you start to get that sound. Then the other things are kind of fall into place naturally. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's. That's why I feel about you. It's like you're a very instinctive player. That you did this kind of stuff just by going for the sound that you liked. Well, I never had anybody to teach me. That. That was the, the thing. Growing up in. Well, I grew up. In a mining town. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, I, uh, hmm. what I was going to talk about before was a lot of people play the soprano with their head buried in their torso down, down here. And that's, you know, that's completely wrong because uh, you, you can't get any kind of sound that way. Do you think there's a difference in these two horns in terms of uh, the way they sound? I mean, 
when you hold, when you play the straight soprano, you tend to hold it up a little bit, right? That's how Sidney Bechet plays. <laughs> that. Mm -hmm. I play it more like that. But it's, you, you can't play it like a clarinet down here. Mm -hmm. Because you bury the sound. This, a lot of the sound is coming you straight have, down. The sound comes straight out. Yeah. That's, I, one thing I do like about the curved soprano yeah. is it, it's kind of projecting it up to you. So right. in a section I hear myself much better when I'm playing the curve. Uh -huh. I, I hear myself relative to everything else a lot louder. If I'm playing the straight soprano, I don't, because I'm not used to it as much, I don't trust the sound as much because it's going kind of far away and yeah, I, over, yeah. I tend to overblow to compensate for uh -huh. it. You know, I love this soprano. Mm -hmm. I've, had, I've had it a long time, mm -hmm. but it's just 1968. Mm -hmm. And it, it's a beautiful horn, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. When I bought it, uh, there was a, a friend of mine who was the manager of Sam Ash, John mm -hmm. Signorelli, and um, he, uh, he, he called me up and he said he had a few Sopranos in, in the shop because I told him I was looking for one. In those days, you could go in the store, a saxophone shop, and they had a bunch of Sopranos, you know? Mm -hmm. Now they have one. They say, hey, you want a Soprano? There you go. <laughs> you know, and you've got no idea how it sounds. The same thing with mouthpieces. But anyway, I tried all these Sopranos and he tried them with me and I couldn't settle on any one of them. And then he said, come back in a couple of weeks. So I went back in a couple of weeks and I picked this one out. He said, I've got bad news. He said, the price went up. It's not 250 anymore, it's 325. <laughs> but he said, but he gave me a neck, a, a new neck for my bass clarinet, and he gave me a bunch of reeds and a and a and a case, a leather case for the soprano. Mm. So he made it up that way. Ah, those were the days. Those were the days, yeah. <laughs> those were the days where you could, you know, Charlie Ponte had a saxophone shop. And you go and say, I want to order like mouthpieces. Oh, hey, it's a, and they had a whole row of them, you know. And you're going to put an advert on eBay that you're looking for an auto link mouthpiece. And then you got to pay. And you got to pay eight or nine hundred dollars for it. <laughs> then it was, yeah. I don't know, fifty dollars or something. Mm -hmm. Remember reeds when you, you could go in and you open a box of reeds and you could pick out maybe six of them out of a box and give them back, give them the rest of them back, and open a new box and get another six. You can buy reeds that way. Right, right, right. Now you get a box of reeds, it holds 25 reeds, you get six reeds and you got to throw the other ones away. <laughs> I use it for kindling at my, at my huh? cabin. I use it for kindling to get fire started at my yeah. cabin. But you know, I, I believe in fixing reeds. I, I believe in, you know, taking the dark shadows out of reeds and, and emery paper them down a bit and get them, get an even kind of, even, even grain. Mm -hmm that you can see through, and I, I find they play better. Every time I try to work on a reed, I mess it up. It sounds yeah. worse than when I got started. Well, you can't go near the tip. You gotta stay away from the tip. Joe Alla told me one time that, you know, to make the reed brighter, you gotta take a little bit off the heel mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. well, that was cool. I just do, I do, do the method you talked about. I just pull them out of the box, and then I throw them away if they don't play. <laughs> that's it. So, again, I'm Ted Nash. I'm and Joe Temperley. And what else? And we'd like to say good night to all our listeners. I'm Ted Nash and you're not. I'm Joe Temperley and you're not. <laughs> all right. And we're going to take you home with a little blue boogie. One, two, three.